Anastasia, welcome. So welcome everybody. My name is Sean Abley. I'm a technology coach at Gilbert Public Schools. Um, I've been teaching technology since 2002 to all ages from kindergarten through 12th grade and now uh, the students, teachers and administrators and staff at the Gilbert Public Schools as a technology coach. My degree is in computer science and I am a standards geek. So when the Department of Ed um, adopted the computer science standards in October of 2018, I honestly couldn't wait to dive into them. Um, they adopted the standards in 2018 and uh, I, over the summer, because I'm a technology coach for K-12 schools in Gilbert, I realized that a lot of my teachers probably had no idea what to do with the standards, if they would even read them when they came out, because they're not connected to AZ merit scores. Um, it's not one of the core subjects. And given another set of standards to elementary teachers, I was pretty sure that they might uh, freak out a little bit. Because I love computer science and I actually do love uh, diving into the standards, I decided to do a project and um, at the end of last year, Sarah at the Department of Ed saw the project that I had done and asked if I would do webinars. And I was totally excited to be able to do that and deliver it to other people across, not just my district, but uh, the state for anyone that was interested. Um, the standards in K-12, I mean, K-5, sorry, are geared towards introducing and developing an understanding of computer science concepts. So a lot of the stuff that they do uh, directly relates to the things that teachers are already doing in classes. So what I wanted to do was break them down into what teachers are already teaching and then also um, give them some extension activities. So hold on one second. I'm gonna stick this in the chat and have you guys let me know what your comfort level is with the computer science standards. So if you would go ahead and click on that link, let me know how you are, how comfortable you are in the computer science standards and we can kind of get an idea and gauge that. So it looks like everyone that has answered um, has looked at them. Perfect. It has some ideas. One, feeling pretty confident. That's awesome. Hopefully I can give you some resources and uh, I would love to hear the resources that you have too. So the standards documents that I created, uh, I made separate documents for K through five. And I'll just click on the fourth grade because it falls in between the three and five. And what I did was take directly from the computer science standards documents that were adopted from the Arizona Department of Ed. On, this, on these documents, everyone are laid out in generally the same manner where it identifies the standard and takes it verbatim from the standards documents. So for example, with teacher guidance, model how internal and external parts of computing connect multiple devices in a computing system. And then I went through and identified how teachers are already addressing these. So for each one of the standards, I showed how they're already doing this in their classrooms. And for some of them, it may just be like changing the way they introduce things or the way they talk, to, talk about things in their classes. So in this example, a computing system is everything that connects to the computer. So their printer, their mouse, their keyboard, their projector, and talking to the kids, <coughs> excuse me, talking about talking to the kids about the different devices. In third grade, they're starting to understand the different parts of a computer, talking about the touchpad, um, the monitor. A lot of kids still think that the monitor is their computer. So using correct terminology with students and letting them know 
uh, the different things that, that they may encounter in class are things that you could already do in class without having to add anything extra to meet the standards. And extension ideas would be, for this example, um, there's tutorials about the inside of a computer, uh, tutorials about basic parts of a computer, and if they have an old computer, which every IT department in any school probably has some old computers laying around and they would love to share them, take it into class and take it apart and show them what the insides look like. So that's just one example, and I'm going to go through several of them throughout this webinar. Um, but you can see that I do it for each one of the standards, how they're already doing it, and extension activities. Standard, how they're already doing it, and extension activities for all um, standards that are, that are addressed. So the uh, computer science standards are broken up into five essential concepts. The first one being computer systems, then networking and the internet, data analysis, algorithms and programming, and the impacts of computing. Each one of those essential concepts has subconcepts under that. So for computer systems, the subconcepts are devices, hardware and software, and troubleshooting. Under the subcon, and again, this is just one. Uh, I think this is the fourth grade from uh, three five, but they're all generally the same. So third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade are are really close. Um, there's not much change from one grade to the other, uh, without with the exception of uh, just higher level thinking. So higher blooms. So with the subconcept of devices, it talks about analyzing and modeling internal and external parts of the computer. Um, work together, um, how the different devices affect humans in positive and negative ways, the hardware and software model how information is transformed into binary to be stored or processed, and demonstrate and explain how hardware can accomplish different tasks depending on the software. Troubleshooting, apply potential solutions and solve simple hardware and software problems using common troublesh uh, troubleshooting strategies. So these are the standards as they're written. Here's ways that teachers are already doing this in their classrooms. With the devices, teaching students the difference between click and right click, click and drag, double click, triple click. Uh, I know that as an adult is when I learned things like triple click, what that would do, and how that changed the way I navigated many documents. Um, talking to your kids about how things are connected. How is the projector connected to our printer? In our district, we're, uh, we have wireless projectors, so our computers are not connected by wires to our, our uh, projectors. However, when something goes wrong, we have to then plug them in and hardwire them. So when something happens in the class, just talk about it so that the students are starting to hear some of the terminology and they're able to follow your troubleshooting tips. Um, positive and negative impacts of technology, we use uh, common sense, um, common sense, uh, digital citizenship in Gilbert Public Schools. And a lot of that talks about balance in the media. And um, when somebody is caught doing something off task, how those can be some negative impacts of the same technology that we're using every day to be able to learn better. With hardware, students are already doing this when given a specific task. So they're already deciding which software they wanna use, um, whether they're using a Chromebook or a phone or a tablet to do a number of tasks. When you give an assessment, when teachers are giving assessments, giving them the option of using a doc, uh, Google Doc, Google Slides, um, Canva, uh, Flipgrid, and asking why, they're, why they chose to use the software that they did. Because basically all of them would be correct all of them would pr produce the same result, but kids are gonna wanna use different things and having them let you know why. The ways they're already doing troubleshooting in the classes is uh, like it says, when students say that they're having trouble with their, when they're having trouble with their device, rather than them saying, it's just not working, have them articulate what exactly is not working about it. Did it freeze? Do you need to shut down? Um, when they tell you that something's wrong with it, asking the student, what have you tried to do to fix it? Or what can you try to do to fix it? So having them start to think about the, 
the steps that they need to take in order to troubleshoot their own devices. Even basic, uh, like being able to articulate that just at their level, will teach them later in life because they're all gonna have to submit a help desk ticket at some point in their life, we all do. And having them being able to say, rather than my computer's broken, um, being able to identify exactly what it is. Teaching students to shut down their computers at the end instead of just logging off. Um, letting, having them, when they say that their computer is frozen, rather than going over there and doing it for them, telling them what they need to do. Why don't you restart it? Did you try a restart? Some extension ideas. With um, devices, involve students in the discussions about what programs to use to complete a task. Should you use a slideshow? Should you use an infographic or a video or some other uh, method to present their topic? Um, how to save stuff in a usable manner. So rather than saving things as untitled, teaching them how to save uh, files with correct file names and putting them in proper folders. When you're talking about hardware and software, Using the terminology in uh, vocab, uh, using something like motherboard, you have a compound word now. They Most of them know how to spell mother. Most of them know how to spell board. So the spelling will be there, but putting attaching the definition to it as a vocab word. If you have, again, if you have access to an old computer, um, take it apart and show them the inside of the parts. Passing around the pieces of a computer is powerful to a kid. Uh, Again, like they think that the monitor is the computer and, that, and then that's what does everything for them. So when you hand them a CPU and you hand them a motherboard and you hand them a hard drive, um, they get some more understanding of what's happening inside their computers. And also it's great uh, for, as far for like troubleshooting for the kids too, because as they get older, I remember um, my dad calling me a few, uh, probably a year ago, um, saying that his computer was slow and he wanted to put more, have more RAM put in it. And he was going to pay to have it done. And, um, and I said, no, you don't need to do that. Just take the cover off. This is what it looks like. And you just plug it in. And he was floored at the fact that I just saved him 75 bucks and it was that easy. So if we start teaching kids these things that it's okay, you know, we have different types of people. We have people that are afraid to tear these things apart and then people that'll just dive right in. So teaching the kids that it's okay to take it apart and um, showing them what to do once they have. My favorite uh, extension activity for troubleshooting is to assign a tech expert job. Um, I'm going to show you this document. So you assign a tech expert job like you would a uh, line leader, a paper passer, a board eraser, um, add a tech expert to the list of jobs. So this kind of gives like a breakdown. And I'll, link, I'll send this out with my follow-up email so you'll have links to all of these things, so you'll have access to them. But it initially teaches one student how to be the tech expert. And this is really, really helpful. Initially, you'll, you'll probably handpick that student. Um, but what's, what's really helpful about this is when you're teaching in a class, then the student becomes the tech expert. When a kid has problems with their computer and you're in the middle of a lesson, the students are now going to your tech expert for advice. Your tech expert is helping them and you can continue teaching your kids. Also, if you have several kids that are having issues, um, maybe it's with a program that you're teaching. So maybe there's not necessarily a problem with the computer, but a, pro a problem with the program that they're, that they're learning. You have an expert in the classroom that can assist ans answering those questions. So what I like most about this is you have that tech expert for a week or two weeks or however long your jobs go. And then the next week you choose another one and you train them and you have the other tech expert train them. Generally classrooms are set up with tables. So you have table one, table two, table three, table four. So when you're choosing your tech experts, start to choose them from different areas of the classroom. So that now when you have two tech experts, there are two different tables. So now there's people to help there. The other thing I use tech experts for is when I'm um, introducing a new software program. Uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm co-teaching in classrooms that I'm unfamiliar with and I don't know the students. So I'll walk into the classrooms of the, of the schools that I know that they use these 
and um, and I say, who are my tech experts? And a couple kids will raise their hands, and I and I let them know, like I need you to pay really close attention because if kids are having questions, I'm going to send them to you to get advice. I'm going to send them to you to help solve those problems. So the tech expert just becomes another help, helping hand when you're trying to teach kids new um, software programs too. The other thing is to set up a classroom help desk. Again, as kids get older, uh, we all do it. There's a problem with your computer that you can't solve, then they need to submit a ticket. This is helpful for the teacher too, because uh, generally speaking, the teachers are submitting the tickets on student Chromebooks or student devices right now. So if the kids fill out a ticket and bring the device and the ticket to you, it's very easy for you to enter that ticket for the um, tech people to come and fix your device. So troubleshooting, I would recommend choosing this as a, you're already doing it and no longer making it an extension idea. Because that will be helpful for your classroom. Any questions about the computing systems? I'll let you throw them in the chat window if you do. Networking in the internet is the next um, essential concept. Under this, the subdomains for networking in the internet are network, communication and organization, and cybersecurity. For cybersecurity, this is really this is really huge right now, especially. Um, you know, after things that happen, like Flagstaff getting shut down for two days because of a cyber threat, um, this is becoming more and more important to be teaching at our schools because the kids are just as much at risk with their systems as the adults are. So identifying solutions to real world cybersecurity problems and how to pro protect your personal information and then the advantages and disadvantages of different networking types. As far as the ways they're already doing it, um, online safety, talking about what uh, happens when a what, what happens when a website is blocked at school, um, why those websites might be blocked. It might not necessarily be something bad, but it might have pop up ads that we can't control. Um, it might lead to places that we can't let students go. So uh, talking to the kids about what ha what's happening when a website is blocked and going to appropriate websites and how to find appropriate websites. Um, when we tell the kids to only go to the sites that their teachers and parents have instructed, we're talking about cybersecurity already. Um, for network security, passwords, 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 uh, teaching the kids not to share passwords. We're already, we're, these are things that the teachers are already doing. We don't share passwords. Um, teaching them to log in by themselves. So rather than letting the neighbor kid log in because you can't remember your username and password, going through those steps in the very beginning so that they all remember their usernames and passwords. By third through third grade, sometimes it's a little difficult in the beginning of the year, but um, if you stick with it, third through fifth grade, there's no problems at all um, learning passwords, making sure that they're not using someone else's and then letting them know why. So if you let somebody else use your password, have these discussions with the kids. Now somebody else has access to your email. They can send out emails as if they are you. Um, if you're a, a single sign-on, if you have single sign-on, we have single sign-on in our district. Those kids can now access everything that has to do with somebody else. So letting them know why we don't share passwords and why they don't log in using somebody else's password. And then as far as communication, the ways that uh, teachers are already using this is um, Talking about uh, the difference for connectivity um, as far as like your phone and when your phone is, is best to be used, uh, connecting to a wireless network, even on your phones or the uh, computers, a guest network versus the secured network and why we use one over the other. And these are just discussions that you can have in everyday conversation throughout the year with your kids when something like this comes up. Some good extension ideas for cybersecurity. Um, there are a ton of videos from NetSafe, and I'm going to bring those up. See them. 
So NetSafe has a bunch of videos and um, they're broken down K3 or six, all the way up through high school. So there's a lot of different ones and they're short. They're two, two and a half minutes. Some of, some of them might be three, um, but they're great videos that you could do in the beginning of class. So in those first five minutes when kids are coming in the door and dropping off their backpacks and you're trying to do attendance, um, these are great videos that could just be shown on a daily basis. So in those transition times. And then if you've not seen the digital citizenship curriculum from Common Sense Media, it is fantastic lesson plans. Um, I don't get paid by any of these people. These are just really great resources that I've uh, come to find. So under the Common Sense, you can choose your grade level. And I'm just gonna choose fourth because this is a three through five um, webinar. And then it gives, for all of them, it gives six different lessons. Six different lessons, does the same six categories, it identifies a category on the right, same six categories for every grade level, but there's different lessons for every grade level. So I'm just gonna open one of them so you can kind of see. When you click on it and then click on lesson plan, I need to sign up or log in. you're logged in when you go to lesson plans it gives a script of what you can teach it gives the lesson slides so it gives the slides and the script goes along with the lessons like say this with slide four it gives the videos if you just wanted to show the video or if you wanted to show the video again later to um, solidify their learning or bring it up again it also has handouts and quizzes and these, I never actually print those out for the kids. I usually do them as a discussion in class. So I'll put them up on the projector and then we'll have those discussions with the class. And then it also gives the family tips and activities. And these are great things that you can send to uh, parents so that they get an idea that, of what they're being taught in schools. Um, I love this curriculum. I've taught many different lessons from it at, at multiple grade levels. Uh, from pre-k which they don't offer that on this they just have the kinder um, but i've modified the kinder to do uh, pre-k up through high school and the feedback that i've been getting on this is fantastic both from students and from teachers the teachers find it extremely easy to teach they find it extremely useful and they report that the students are actively engaged in discussions discussions they wouldn't necessarily have had this not been brought up. So from all avenues, I've been hearing really positive feedback from it, which is exciting to me because I really liked the lesson plans. I liked the curriculum myself, but until you actually put it in front of a class, you kind of never know. So if you've not used Common Sense Media, I would highly recommend it. It's all free. Um, all you need to do is sign, it, uh, sign up and then log in. Students do not need computers for that at all. So if you're a district that has limited equipment, um, you just throw it up on the, on the projector and go along with it. For network security, I like to have the students make comparisons between networks and other things that they're familiar with. The most common being a road system. So you have your main road system that connects all of the, um, all of the that connects to all the houses eventually and our internet works very, very much the same way. So that's something that they're familiar with, um, how the city streets differ from a freeway. So if you had slow internet, you might be on a city street as opposed to fast internet being on the freeway and just relating that to different networks. So those things can come up, uh, the nervous system or the circulatory system are both other ones. Those things can kind of just come up in discussion during a science class, when you're talking about the nervous and circulatory system, hey, this is kind of like a computer network and here's how it is. With communication, um, this is always fun. If, uh, if you have a cla another class in your school or if there's another school in the district, or even if you know somebody who's teaching elsewhere in the world, um, having a video lesson with another classroom somewhere else. Um, the students love to do it because they're able to see people in different places. Uh, it's really fun if you can do it in a different school than yours. 
most fun if you can do it in a different state or country even. Um, and there's a lot of people that are doing those kind of things. So that would fall into any subject area. Social studies, really well. Uh, if you find somebody in a different in a different area, and then you can you can your um, communication could be about comparing and contrasting the different things from your classroom to theirs. Data analysis, the subcategories for data analysis are collection, visualization, and transformation, storage, and inference and models. This one is one of my favorite ones because um, there's so much you can do with data. So the subconcepts are collection, visual, visualization, and transformation. They select tools to collect, organize, manipulate, and present data. Um, storage, the different file extensions, how things are stored and retrieved. So where you store them, as, whether it's on a drive or in the cloud. And inference and models is using data for cause and effect, predict outcomes. And these are things, these three things are done in almost every classroom already. So this one's an easy one to automatically um, be meeting the standards. So how are they already doing it? Every single math class from kindergarten through high school is using graphs. I've seen the young kids doing um, picture graphs. The um, secondary ed is doing big graphs on data that they're collecting. Science is always collecting data. Um, a lot of classes, a lot of teachers in the elementary are recording uh, reading minutes and um, reading logs. So transferring that is not a big deal. As far as like, how does this, um, if you're if you're reading for 10 minutes a day, how does that affect your test scores? So we're talking about collecting the data and how that um, affects everything. There are countless ways in which uh, data collection are already being used in the classroom. Um, storage, anytime that they're opening a document and reopening it later, they're having to learn about storage. Um, teaching the kids to to save stuff in files and folders. I'm not always the best at that, but um, when I am, it's easier to find the things that I've saved. Teaching the kids not to save things as untitled so that they're able to locate those things later. And these are all things, again, that they're already, teachers are already doing in classes. You're already doing them. Um, organizing their drives, again, like in folders, whether it's it, you know, like this is my first grade folder, my second grade folder, and then putting subfolders within, um, but teaching them to use those folders right from the beginning. And then as far as inference and models, this is happening in all subject areas. They're analyzing charts, whether it's their behavior chart, their reading chart, uh, their multiplication chart, how many things that they can do in five minutes. Um, all of those things help them predict how they're going to do on testing, help them predict how things are gonna how things are gonna react. So the more time they spend reading, what's gonna happen? Your test scores are gonna go up. The more time you spend in good behavior, the less time you spend in trouble. Um, using graphs in math and science. Um, and one of my favorites is goal setting. So when you're talking about goal setting and discussions with about goals including charts and graphs to measure their progress towards their goals. And these don't necessarily have to be um, computer made charts. So if students are creating charts in general, they're already learning how to do these, um, these skills. I get really excited about data analysis. For extension, Activities, um, collecting data using Google Forms. Most teachers are using Google Forms now, but teaching the students how to use the Google Google Forms, um, creating uh, charts in Google Sheets, collect data using a Google Form, and then using the Google Sheet to sort it, filter it, graph it. Um, I have a. Is 
a good example of something that you could do with the students. So here's a simple chart based on an M and M activity. So an M and M activity in math. This is something that could be shared on a in a Google Classroom, so all students have access to it. And it has the master copy and then group one, group two, and group three. And then what the students do is they go to their group, it comes up with no data, they count the number of M&Ms in a bag and enter the information. I don't know that there's ever been 34 orange in a bag of M&Ms, but we're gonna go with it. So the students just need to enter the data. I could create this spreadsheet in probably four minutes and post it to a Google Classroom. Most teachers that are doing these things can as well. This would take the students a long time to do on their own, but if you've created it initially and then posted it to the Google Classroom, they get the same, uh, they get the same input, they get the same learning as they would as if they made it themselves. And what this does is it breaks it down to a really simple thing where all they have to do is enter numbers in cells. While you're here, you can start talking a little bit about spreadsheets and then the students that get this done quickly, then you can have them go in and edit their chart. So you can teach them how to edit their chart. And what I've found is when you have it, so for example, if group two was done early, then everybody else is still working. I myself can go to group two, teach them how to edit their chart and let them know that when group one and three are done, you guys are gonna have to teach them how to edit their chart. So you've taken a very easy thing for the kids. They'll all be able to do this just by opening a, a Google Sheet. And then you're able to work with smaller groups on the extension stuff. And if they don't all get to it, well, that's okay. It's just uh, um, extension ideas on top of extension ideas. So using charts like this as an activity in class, huge, huge for the kids to be able to learn. Another thing I did was made um, reading logs. I made these for one of the um, elementary resource teachers. She wanted her kids to keep track of their own reading minutes. So this is another thing that could be made once, put on Google Classroom, set so that um, every student gets their own copy through Google Classroom. So you make this once. This one probably would take about 10 minutes to make because you make the master and then copy them out, but because it needs dates, um, it might take a little bit longer, but still, this would take no longer than 10 minutes to create it and put it in a Google Classroom. And then they know that it's November. Today's November 6th. They read for seven minutes today. Yesterday, they read for 15 minutes. Days before. And then it automatically creates the graph for them. So now they can start to compare their reading log minutes to their test scores when you're having um, conferences with the kids themselves. This is always this is also great information for parents if their parents are wondering why they're not doing well in their language arts class in this example. And then you pull this up and say, well, Mr. or Mrs. Student, um, it looks as though your child has been reading less at home. And this is an easy graph for you to share with the parent. You share it with the parent. They're able to see the same thing that you are. They can open it on a daily basis too. And this is something that it took you 10 minutes to make for your entire class. So using those kind of extension activities um, help you as a teacher and the kids as well. Inference and models. Inference again is um, making decisions based on the information that you have. Reanalyzing those reading logs. So looking at those reading logs and analyzing them. Mystery bags is a cool thing that goes with science. I just found this um, while I was doing this project. And uh, you put stuff in a bag and you have to de depend on your senses to figure out what's in it. Well, that's an inference. And we use those in computer science all the time. And a lot of the stuff, again, like what we're teaching our K-5 mostly is the relationship between everyday life 
and computer science. So it's not like this mystical creature out there that, that they're afraid of later. So this is just an example of you put stuff in the bags and have the kids figure out what's in them. If I were doing this with my class, I would put technology items in a bag. Maybe the ones that were on the vocab, like a mouse or keys from a keyboard or um, I don't know, a jump drive or, or whatever you could find, a CPU. So using those things in the mystery bags and having them use their knowledge to figure out what's in there. Now we're talking about inference. And then we talked about the reading logs. I skipped storage for a second. Sorry about that. I'm going to go back to it right now. Um, when you're talking about storage to always save things with titles. So never saving things as untitled. And then, um, this was something that I like to do with my students was uh, use different file types in place of a spelling or vocab. Most of the kids are going to be familiar with a lot of these, but some of them will be unfamiliar. So these have the vocab word. Dot ng is a graphic file dot HTML. That's going to be a website. So they're starting to learn these things in really easy little chunks. They would have to do you have spelling and vocab anyways. Why not include this one week? Parents like to see it too when they're bringing those things home and they know that the teachers are actually teaching them uh, computer things too because the parents don't really know that these um, the computer science standards exist. Any questions, comments, concerns about um, data and analysis? I'll let you put it in the chat if you do. Going too fast, too slow, just right. We'll talk about algorithms and programming. Um, algorithms and programming consists of the sub concepts control algorithms and variables and program development. And this is when teachers start to get a little bit nervous, but honestly, uh, algorithms and programming are taking place all day in your classrooms. Um, algorithms consist of a set of steps to complete a task. So, at the very basic level, uh, this is a method you use to get your students' attention. Here's an example. When I say one, two, three, eyes on me, you reply one, two, eyes on you, and then you're quiet. So we have a set of instructions. One, when I say one, two, three, eyes on me. Two, you reply one, two, eyes on you. Three, then you're quiet. So that's an algorithm. Step by step, this is exactly what's supposed to happen when, um, when these instructions are given. This is probably why um, algorithms and programming start to get a little bit uh, scary for teachers because this is when it starts, they, they start to become more. So with algorithms, we're comparing, testing, and re refining multiple algorithms, figuring out which one's the most effective. Control and modularity, um, creating programs, including sequencing, events, loops, these are stuff that are already happening though, and I'm going to show you how. Decomposing problems into manageable subproblems. When we're talking about that, we're talking about decoding words. So in third through fifth grade, we're still learning vocab. We're learning how um, we're learning what words are, how to say these words. Teachers don't say just sound it out. They've broken these up into chunks just like this. So they're decomposing problems into manageable subproblems already happening. Modify, remix, or incorporate portions of an existing pro a program into one's own. And this is important because um, most of the programming is based off something that's already been written. This, that has to do with research. Most of our research papers are based off of something that has already been written. So we take a bunch of information and turn it into a research paper. With the subconcept program development, um, Planning a program using other people's uh, perspectives and other people's preferences. This sometimes is hard for third through fifth grade because they think that the whole world revolves around them. Um, but what would be best for other people? What do other people think would be the best way to solve this problem? Observing intellectual property rights and give appropriate um, credit where credit is due. Uh, we do this when we cite our sources. Test and debug, so fixing programs within your algorithms, um, taking on varying roles. 
This is happening when you give group work and you assign one person to be the note taker, one person to the presenter. They're having varying roles within the project that they're doing, which is very similar to programming and program development. And then um, making choices about what they're doing on their programs. Teachers are usually uh, pretty surprised to find out that they're already doing this. Um, and there's tons and tons of resources for these. Uh, for algorithms and variables, variables are being talked about in algebra starting in like third, fourth, fifth grade. They're, they're starting to talk about variables and, and what is X and solving for Y. Um, discussing how students can get the same answer using a different process. So I might use one method of division and another student might use a different method of division. We both come up with the exact same answer. Which one would have been best? Teachers are talking to their kids about this stuff already. So um, discussing step-by-step -step, uh, instructions and which is the best solution and identify how we came up with the best solution. Like what is the best solution based on? Is it the quickest? Is it the most thorough? Is it efficient? Is it cost effective? These are things that are happening in classes already. And most often it's happening during group work. Table one came up with this answer. How did you get that table one? Table one tells you, did anyone come up with the same answer in a different manner? Teachers are doing this. I've been in the classrooms where I hear it. That all relates to computer science. And if the teachers kind of start relating what they're doing in class and using technical terms, then they're meeting the standards without having to add anything else. That's really what this is kind of all about. Control and modularity, um, control stu structures, specify the order in which instructions are um, executed. So decoding words, breaking it into smaller chunks in order to solve the problem, solving puzzles, whether they're jigsaw puzzles or um, like word puzzles, uh, escape room puzzles, um, those all have to be broken up into little chunks in order to come up with the final answer. Continue until, so when you talk to your kids, I want you to continue reading until you hear the bell. That is control and modularity. Timelines, the water cycle, um, our, the cycles are all loops. We create loops in computer science. So being able to relate those two things. And then um, program development, there's so much involved in program development that is incorporated in everyday activities. Uh, st students are always debugging things. So they got the answer incorrect. My favorite thing is math. Math is a great place to use this in because um, inevitably you're going to have the kid that says, when am I ever going to use this? And you can tell them maybe never, but what it's teaching you is the skills to persevere and get the correct answer because there is one right answer. And if you don't have it, then you need to go back and figure out where you went wrong. That is debugging. Um, by allowing students to do test corrections or homework corrections, they are debugging. So when you let them do that, tell them to debug their test, debug your assignment. You've got some errors in your code, go back and debug it and then bring it back. Um, uh, sequencing, doing uh, things like the scientific method that have an exact order that things have to go in in order to work. These are all things that are already happening in classrooms. The extension ideas, um, discussing routines and how they relate to computer science, using the word algorithm. So using it, uh, we were I was talking about it today. They were talking about um, being in home ec and discussing the algorithm to bake cookies. That works. A recipe is an algorithm. You have to follow it in order for your your uh, recipe to turn out. Um, variables. What's going to happen when I change this? What happens if I add too much sugar to my cookies? That was a variable that we changed and what happened? Um, control and modularity. There's a bunch of uh, code.org has a bunch of unplugged activities. I'm not sure if um, most people have used code.org if they're involved in computer science at all. Great uh, resource. Click on it. And Happy Maps is the one. 
I'll play a little bit for you. I'm going to run out of time. This lesson is called Happy Maps. Today, we're going to help our furry little friend, the Flurb, get to her fruit. Make your Flurb go to your fruit. To do this, you'll need to figure out which way the Flurb needs to go and direct her with arrows. In order for the Flurb to get to the apple, what direction does the Flurb have to go? Mine, make it go up. And to get it there, you circle the direction that it has to go. So you can see it's a it's an easy activity, um, but you can also modify. I've used this in preschool as well as uh, like high school. So they're using flurbs. Um, when I did it in a kindergarten class, they have the carpet squares. We put an item in one of the squares, and one student was the computer, and one was the programmer. And the programmer was holding an arrow and told them which direction to go. To get to the object on the carpet squares. Uh, we do this in, in the high schools by giving a set of commands to that they have to follow. We just did it with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at um, one of the high schools, the honors, the honor students. So they had to this. They were working with 6th graders. The 6th graders had to give directions to make a peanut butter sandwich. They wrote all the directions down and then another student had to follow those directions in order to make the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They could only follow the directions that were there. And, um, and as you can, I'm sure imagine that pro that turned into a little bit of a disaster, but a, a learning experience kind of disaster. So it was good um, with program development. They have other unplugged activities. Um, there's a sequencing game online coding and scratch or code.org are all excellent ways to expose students to program development. Questions about program development. Check in the chat if you do. Okay. Impact of computing is the uh, last of the essential concepts, and it covers um, culture, social interactions, safety, law, and ethics. Um, as far as culture, being able to identify the technologies that have changed the world. Um, designing ways to improve accessibility and the usability of technology, um, seeking opportunities for collaboration, and then using um, using public domain uh, without affecting copyright. Are the teachers already doing it with culture, comparing technology and how it's evolved positively, negatively, um, and the evolution? This is another great one to to bring out the um, older technologies. A lot of us have a, our first phone. Mine was a pager. Um, most kids have never seen a pager, so that's always interesting for them. Um, talking about the differences in technology and how far it has come. Um, things like, you know, that we used to we didn't have cable TV or when we had dial up Internet and how that has changed. We talk about those things during classes anyways, but just being more purposeful in your conversations with kids will bring the standards right in with what you're teaching. Social interactions, uh, we're already doing this anytime we get kids online, we're teaching them to work respectfully. We're teaching them to be responsible with others. Um, when we have discussions about their expectations and anti-bullying discussions these all come up in regular classrooms right now before teachers have even thought about dealing or diving into the computer science standards so these are things that are already happening in classrooms um, as far as safety law and ethics uh, again keeping your information private students don't always know that they shouldn't share their adults don't always know that they shouldn't share this information with each other we see it on news reports um, we might see it in our own buildings that that people have had this happen to them and reminding the importance reminding students the importance of keeping passwords safe and not sharing your personal information with people online some of the extension ideas um, again show examples of the evolution of different technologies this is fun and kids love it they like to see the way things used to be um, 
to create a timeline of the evolution of technology and then print it out and hang it around your classroom. Uh, another great one is create a slideshow, a collaborative slideshow. So now that we're now we're talking about social interactions too, um, create a collaborative slideshow where each kid gets a different era. So for example, nineteen um, twenties, maybe we maybe we do about the telephone only, and each student has the one student has the twenties, twenty five, thirty, thirty five, forty, and they fill in the different slides on a slideshow. So now they're looking at the evolution of a different technology and collaborating at the same time. Talking about the advantages and disadvantages of old and new technology. Um, there's a funny video. I'll, just, I'll show you a small clip of it because I'm going to run out of time here in a second. I don't want to do that. But again, th this is this is all going to be shared with you in an email that I send out um, probably tomorrow as a follow up. But this is kids react to old computers. <laughs> So you turn the monitor on. Where else might an odd switch be? Hello. How do we do this? It's, uh, it's... So there's just a, a short clip of um, kids react to old computers, and it's funny to watch the kids' reactions. Like we think it's funny because we've had them. Um, but it's even more fun to show it to the students and see how they react to them too. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, if you want to have a full curriculum and just do dive into computer science with your students, code.org is an excellent, excellent place to start. Um, I kind of broke I made a I made one of my own and broke it down into which courses I would teach for what grade levels. So for third, fourth, and fifth, I would do course C, D, and E. The great thing about code.org is it is self-paced. The students can you can put the kids on um, the different activities. You can interact with them as well with some of the unplugged activities, and it walks the kids through um, the course. walks the kids through with a video and then some practice and then a challenge and it does that for almost every lesson. So code.org is an excellent resource if you're wanting to just dive in and completely cover all of the um, computer science standards. They're all covered by going through one of the courses. The pros to it is it is K-12. You can set up the classes and track their progress. So you can set up classes as a teacher, assign the students to your classes and then see exactly their progress throughout each of the lessons does have an entire curriculum, or um, if you want to just do an hour of code, or you want to get them into some coding, but you don't want it to be consistent all the time, then you can just have a single lesson in code.org. They have free professional learning activities for teachers. Uh, again, there's multiple levels. It'll go anywhere from kindergarten through high school, and they have a bunch of unplugged activities if you, um, if you don't have comp access to computers for your kids. Some of the things that I don't like about code.org is it doesn't offer different languages, so you're stuck with the one that they've they've chosen for you. Um, what we've found is we've been using it more and more in our in our district. So sometimes as the students get older, they get a little bit bored with it. Uh, it's all in block code, so there's not a lot of actual typing of code. And as a teacher, uh, sometimes you get lost in what to teach because there's so many resources. But if you're interested in using code.org, I've used it a lot and kind of had uh, I've dove into it quite extensively, and I'd be more than happy to um, help you get that set up or guide your teachers even, because I know that some of you are uh, like the tech coaches at your schools too. So I'm more than happy to help with those kind of things. Does anyone have any questions uh, about any of this stuff? Anything you'd like me to clarify or go over? If you do, um, you can send those questions to me at uh, my email address. Sarah Sleesman is with the Arizona Department of Education. 
Her um, contact information is on this slide too. Um, again, I'll send you this slideshow probably tomorrow so you'll have access to this, um, to all the resources, to our contact information or um, anything else you need. Honestly, if you have questions or uh, you get back to your classrooms and you wonder what that thing was that we talked about, please feel free to email me at any time. I'm very excited about this. I'm really excited to share uh, the stuff that I know. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be able to collaborate with other people too, because the more the questions that other people have, the more I get to learn. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Miss Abley. I'm going to stop the recording.